So what's the evidence for liposuction? Well, there's now lots of evidence, and I've presented this, some of this before. Way back in 2012, Schmeller presented, published in the British Journal of Dermatology. Now, that is a renowned publication. It's not one of these hunt down, halfway down the internet to try and find. It's a big publication, and he published on 255 patients. So there was a lot of good evidence demonstrating improvements in long-term results. And likewise, previous to that, Stutes way back in 2009 first published about water-assisted liposuction and the results. And there's been numerous publications over the years since then, all again talking about improvement in pain, improvement in the quality of life, reduction in bulk, and that's all there. And that's over 500 patients. There's been more publications since then. So it does surprise me somewhat with NICE's answer and outcome. And we'll get to that in a minute. And so that's really all I'm going to talk about with the evidence, because there is more evidence out there for liposuction for lipedema than there ever was for liposuction for lymphedema when NICE approved that. Because the only person doing it at the time was Brorson when I submitted the application. That was it. It was one surgeon's data that NICE approved on. We've got at least a dozen surgeons now presenting data and it wasn't accepted. So if we look at what I've seen since 2011, when we first started doing lipedema, because we started lymphedema way back in 2005 with arms and 2007 with legs. So since 2011, I've seen 363 patients with lipedema, and that's my diagnosis of lipedema, not the referral diagnosis. And that's out of about 700 patients I've seen. You can see almost 300 of them were Scottish. So a large number of patients from Scotland. And you can see that, I don't know why Highland comes up in black. I'm not sure why that's like that, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, material. Obviously, the majority have been from Tayside and Fife, because that's the areas that we service mainly, but we're getting more referrals. Glasgow's a bit awkward, because it may be Glasgow, it may be Ayrshire, it may be yeah, Lanarkshire. It De just depends where the referrals come in from. Um, but we've had a fair number of referrals from across most boards, some more than others. And you can see we've offered, and that's offered liposuction to a number of patients from virtually every board. So what was the criteria for surgery? Well, even up until 2019, when we had to stop, well, 2020, when we had to stop as a result of a little thing called COVID-19, my criteria was still evolving. It was essentially for stage two and three. I'd seen a number of patients with early stage one wanting to get liposuction to stop it progressing or to cure it because that's what one of the early publications suggested and obviously we sent them away. Um, at least two litres excess volume or more than 20% and anybody that's been in my clinic will know that I'm fairly good at looking at a leg and guesstimating the volume before the nurses have actually measured it and I'm usually correct with about a litre. So I was able to then accurately, fairly accurately say there's about five, six litres excess. So it allowed us to start calculating what we might be looking at in terms of BMI. And I used to say, OK, your BMI's 50. You're never going to get down to 35 on your own. So what have you got excess in your legs? OK, it's 5 litres plus 5 in your buttocks. That's 15 litres. That's 15 kilos. So what would your BMI weight have to be to get BMI 35? Let's add 15 to that. And there's your target weight. So we were trying to meet patients halfway. Laterally, we started following the ILA guidelines and looking at BMI under 35. Likewise, we then also started looking at waist to height ratio less than 0.5 as a good indicator that there's not a lot of excess in the middle and there's not a lot of central obesity going on. Are they wearing compression garments? Because they need to wear compression garments post-op. Are they motivated and realistic? And what were the functional issues? Because again, all these things had to be taken into consideration before we'd offer surgery. NHS treatment, it was admitted the day before, it was a four night stay. The patients always got casted initially, which some women just did not like, did not want. Uh, we changed the garment on day one and would mobilise. And patients would generally go home day three. And I have to say, even going home day three, for some of them that was a bit soon, which is why some of these private treatments where you're out in and out the same day is a bit much to take in. We'd see them at two weeks and change them into compression stocking. And then the second leg, because we would do one leg in the entirety, the second leg would get done three months later, give or take, and then buttocks down the line if necessary. 
And that's where we differ with all these papers that are published, because these are all following the German dermatological technique, tumescent liposuction, where they're doing bits of limbs at a time, because they can only take so, uh, inject so much and take so much out. So the procedure was using a microair power assisted. We do the lower leg under tourniquet, so we exsanguinate, do it dry, what's called dry liposuction, so it's only fat that's coming out, there's no fluid unless there's a bit of lymphedema. Then we put a juxtafit on, and we used juxtafit trims because we could cut them to measure to fit the size of the leg that we needed to. So we're working that on the table, not telling somebody to bring a garment that somebody's guessed what size they're going to need post-op. We would then take the tunic off the thigh, inject some tumescent fluid, so it's fluid with local anaesthetic and adrenaline to help control bleeding, give a bit of pain relief, do the liposuction to the thigh, and then the rest of the juxta garment would go on. And you can see the majority of what comes out is fat. So, out of the 363 patients that we've seen, 98 have been offered liposuction, which has now been completed, well not completed, but 55 patients have undergone 128 operations. I say not completed because one patient was waiting for her buttocks, and that's now off the cards. 108 legs and 20 buttocks. So you can see that mean pre-op volume was 14 litres, 14 kilograms. That ranged from 4 litres, you wonder why that's so, slow, so low, that's a girl with achondroplasia who has lipedema, because they can still get lipedema. Up to 33 litres, and that was a girl who were doing a stage reduction because of her size, because she could struggle to mobilise. And we only ever did one operation on each leg. So we'd aspirate on average four and a half litres, but anything from 800 up to 8.5 litres. Now this is part of the issue that NICE had was the large volume liposuctions and concerns, particularly with the tumescent liposuctions, with lots of fluids going in and out and fluid shifts. We've not seen that issue with this technique. So you can see that overall, 542 kilograms of fat have been removed from 55 patients. And then if you break it down on per person, that's almost 10 kilograms on average, from as little as 2 kilograms to 20 kilograms I've taken off people over the last 10 years. If we look at the leg reduction, now this is the only measure we, we can do. It's easy for the lymphedema because we've normally got con a normal lymphedema measure against. Lymphedema officer would do in both legs, we don't. So all I've been able to do is look at what was the pre-op volume, what's the post-op volume, and is the post-op volume maintained? And as we can see, we've gone from 14 down pretty much down to about a litre at three months, uh, 10 litres at three months, but then it gradually increased a little bit. And you can see percentage reduction got up to almost 30% on average, but then dropped off and sits around about 20. Now, obviously, that's all the patients, so some of these pre ops may not have come, and you can see because we've only got 59, 77 at 24 months, we've lost a lot of legs in that time. So I then thought, let's just look at those 77 and see if there's much difference. Again, you can see that 70, 76 we've got at 14 um, litres and about just over 10 litres at two years. So the reduction's gradually dropping off. You can see 30% at three months and down to 20% at two years. So what's going on? Are these patients suddenly putting the lipidema back on? Well, in some cases they are, because certainly during COVID, I saw some of the patients that had been operating on just before COVID that came back and their weight had clearly gone up during COVID because they were sitting at home, they weren't able to do anything, they were just eating. And their weight had gone up, the leg volumes had gone up. And some have regained and some developed lipedema. And I can tell that because I can tell from the tissue when we feel it. I've got other patients whose leg volumes have gone up and yet you look at the legs and you think, oh, they're great. And I feel the tissue and I can still pinch a centimeter on the calf because that's what I pinched at the end of the operation. And I can still pinch an inch in the thigh, which is what I pinched at the end of the operation, because that's my two measurements. And what's happened is the leg volume's gone up because they're more active, and they put muscle bulk on. So leg volume on its own isn't an ideal way to measure long-term outcome, but it's the only one we've got, apart from quality of life. And again, if we look at three, this is using the Lickley uh, quality of life indicator, which was for lymphedema. So one or two of the questions don't apply to lipedema. But it's the closest thing we've got at the moment. Three domains, physical, psychosocial and practical. 
And because they've got a different number of questions, therefore the scores are different, to compare them, I've converted this to percentage. So you can see that psychosocial has the worst pre-op score for quality of life, and so improves the most. But they all improve quite significantly. Unfortunately, there is a trend from six months to 12 months is starting to go up a little bit. Because unfortunately, other life events start to interfere and intervene. And so some of the other things are impacting on your quality of life, more so than the lipidema is, so it changes. So again, long-term outcomes of quality of life are unreliable because other things will interfere. So short-term, it's great, but we can't use that realistically and reliably long-term. That's fine. Just a couple of post-op pictures just to see. That was actually her first patient. Five liters. you can see she's still got the excess tissue in her legs, which some surgeons would then cut out. Uh, but in garments, it works well, and I insist all my patients stay in garments. I know some surgeons say that garments are only short term because, again, liposuction is curative. You can't cure something if you don't know what causes it. And again, two litres, sorry, that yellow doesn't come out very well, about three litres removed from uh, both legs. Oh, that's even worse, at least from here it is. I'm not sure what it looks like to you, but it looks. So again, we can see one leg, you see the difference between one, the right leg and the left leg, then after both legs, again, you see there's still loose skin. This is something that's unique to the lipidema. The skin does not retract the same. My lymphedema patients get lovely retraction, skin redrapes, and you would never know they would had surgery. Lipidema patients are usually left with excess skin, so some surgeons will excise that. Complications, well, we've had a few bits of bleeding, some sensory changes, pain. A couple of patients have got blood clots in their legs, usually on the unoperated first leg, so the leg that had never been touched, usually several weeks down the line when they've been away doing other things. One patient had been away on a retreat in, Par in France, a Buddhist retreat, came back with a DVT and got a PE. So was that really surgery? Well, it was within two months, so it was logged as a post-op DVT PE. Probably more to do the fact that she was sitting cross-legged all day. But anyway. And we had one patient who got a compartment syndrome, which ultimately led to an amputation. And obviously recurrence due to fluctuating weight and unhealthy eating is the biggest concern. Obviously COVID-19 came along and that had an impact. We had nine patients on the waiting list at the 1st of March 2020. Four of them actually had dates, Lorna being one of them. And unfortunately, they all had to be postponed at that time. We managed to get three patients operated on who had had their first leg done pre-COVID. I managed to get management to agree that we'd treat them, get their second leg done in the summer of 2020. And thereafter, I've done no liposuction because we do not have capacity. I added four subsequent to that waiting list because I was told I could still see patients and add them on. And the latest instruction was, as a result of NICE guideline is that all Patients waiting for live suction for lipidema have to be removed from the waiting list. Uh, and letters were eventually sent out last autumn. Initially, I was told I could see out of area patients from Scotland only. Well, once COVID with all the restrictions, we initially Tayside, that's the rest of Scotland. And then last year, it was fluctuated as to whether I could see them or not. And then from August, again, it's instructed that I could see Tayside and five patients only because we did not have capacity. So. Ultimately, we saw 76 patients post-COVID from within Scotland. And I say since September, it's been Tayside Fife only. Now, what's interesting is obviously the lymphedema practitioners were talking about about 10 to 15 percent of their workload is lipedema. I would say that in the last five years, in excess, and probably in the last, certainly what was on my waiting list last year, in excess of 80 percent was lipedema. Probably 50 percent in the last five years have been lipedema for what was set up as a lymphedema surgical service. So look at, let's look at NICE. Well, what did NICE say? NICE said that there needed to be evidence on safety and that the evidence and safety of the effect was inadequate. So they're saying that they didn't consider what was published was adequate. That this procedure should only be used in the context of research. They made it quite clear that by research they meant an ethics approved Medical Ethics Committee approved research. So not a case of what I've been doing, which is study, recording data and keeping it and then going and getting permission to actually analyse the data we've already collected and publish it. They wanted an ethics approved prospective study. And again, they also said that it should be carried out in a facility that had level two, level three 
care, hospital care, i.e. high dependency intensive care facilities in case they got some of the serious complications. And it encouraged a registry for all patients having liposuction. As I say, there are a few private surgeons with their own clinics or hospitals who are offering surgery and they're often changing terminology to get around. So instead of being lipedema, they're calling it other things or yeah, disguising what's happening. So in summary, obviously we've already talked about a lot of this. In terms of lipedema, there's a need for greater awareness. It's a medical condition and it's not simple obesity. We do need better education of all the healthcare professionals and the public. We need adequately resourced facilities for diagnosis, support and management for lipedema patients. And it should be recognised in a similar way to other long-term conditions. Liposuction on its own is effective at reducing the bulk, decreasing pain and improving quality of life. Unfortunately, it may recur after liposuction. Mm -hmm.